Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Forum. This is where we are very lucky to have a collection of CEOs and people who bring uh, wisdom and experience about the topic of leaving a legacy in your lifetime. And uh, we have James Bashel, uh, many roles that James has done as an army commander um, and also advisor to boards now, but he's also the president of the Royal British Legion, which is uh, nationally renowned. Uh, Emma Kane, the CEO of SEC Newgate, but Emma also is chair of Target Ovarian Cancer and uh, one of the board members of the Elton John AIDS Foundation. Uh, Sir Peter Wanless, the CEO of the NSPCC, and also a great love of Somerset uh, cricket, county cricket, and uh, involved uh, as a board member there. Darren Moorcroft, the CEO of the Woodland Trust, uh, looking after our forests and our woods for the future. And Paul Howarth, the CEO of the National Nuclear Laboratory, looking at all about the sustainability and future of our energy and many other topics, as well as Lee Bowman Perks, the CEO of the Inspiring Leadership Trust, helping vulnerable women and girls uh, to uh, get out of the awful situations they're in and make something of their lives. So uh, without further ado, let's do our first round, which is um, what do you feel is important about leaving a legacy in your lifetime? James, would you start us off? What do you feel is important about leaving a legacy in our lifetime? Yeah, good afternoon, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, I think it's a fascinating subject. Um, I think it's almost a contradiction in saying leaving a legacy in your lifetime, because I think everyone would probably wish to have a legacy when they leave and to be remembered in a very positive way. And I think trying to shape that or overshape that can lead to selfish and bad behaviours. Mm. And I I think the key thing for me is to get that in balance. And, and I think I, I know other people have thought about this quite a lot about, you know, should you, if you over focus on your CV and you are just doing stuff because it's going to make you look better and get you a better job, then you probably are not focusing on some of the right things that you want to leave behind. So I think it's important because we'd all like to think that we've left the world a better place than, than we inherited it that we focus on those long-term goals and aspirations, perhaps around well-being and happiness, rather than focusing on some of the short-term gains in life, which can sometimes lead us to be a little bit selfish and to behave not as we would really wish others to judge us by. So I would think that if you're going to leave a, a legacy in your lifetime, you're gonna take a long-term look at this and it's gonna be about perhaps less ostentious success than, than um, than perhaps people would have first imagined. Mm, no, it's a really good point. Thank you, James. Uh, Emma, what's your thoughts on about what you feel is important about leaving a legacy in, in your lifetime? Thank you. Um, I think it's about understanding really where that positive impact is needed and, and what your own personal um, sort of special skill is that you can bring to it because um, you know, everybody has their own uh, special uh, abilities that they bring into the workplace or into charities and so on and and so I think it's identifying what that is and and really then um, listening to people to understand truly where that change is needed because the problem is that so many people as, as uh, James rightly said just focus on the things that either they enjoy or that are just about them but really it is is where where is the help needed what cultural change is needed um, I mean, whether it's in, in families in terms of everybody, you know, bringing up children uh, and helping them find self-esteem and understand the bits that they're good at in, or in businesses, the culture within organisations or in charities, really helping to move the dial for that long term goal, um, um, not just a sort of knee jerk thing. So I think there, there, are, there are a number of elements, but it's understanding where you can actually make a difference mm. um, uh, in, in the bigger picture and over the long term. Yeah, no, very nicely put. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Speed of um, what, what do you feel is important about leaving a legacy in your lifetime? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, when I was a child, um, I was really sure that if I wasn't going to be a rock star, um, I was going to be a fantastic cricketer. And I was going to open the batting for Somerset, who were our local team, um, and for England. And, and by any stretch of the imagination and marginal measure, I've completely failed <laughs> against all those uh, criteria um, in my life. But I think that um, 
legacy, uh, if you want to leave a, a legacy, then following your kind of passions and your interests and having a kind of determination to achieve something associated with what really matters to you is important. And one way or another, um, via a range of extraordinary kind of circuitous routes and coincidences, I now find myself um, on the board at Somerset County Cricket Club, despite living in Kent. Um, that's where my heart is. And I really enjoy um, going to meetings and making a contribution to my club's um, success. And in, in my own sort of small way, without really um, uh, doing anything um, on the pitch. So, you know, last time I, I went down, they they gave me this, which is my own oh. Somerset shirt, signed by the, uh, the, the, the whole team. And so part of my legacy um, will always be this shirt. And my family, who aren't particularly interested in Somerset, what we achieve on or off the pitch, will always know that this is a really special thing. And it was something that was a kind of award to me from my club for something that I was doing um, to help them. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about kind of being authentic and following your dreams and, and all of that. And they don't, they don't always come true, but with kind of determination and, and focus. And if you're sufficiently kind of passionate or, 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 or interested in, in something, there will be a way of connecting to what really matters to you. And if you're mm. engaged in what matters to you, then um, you're more likely to do it well. Mm. Mm. No, beautifully put. Thank you, Peter. Darren, welcome from the car near, near which forest are you near at the moment? One of your forests? I'm heading back from Hainault Forest, uh, just in Essex. Yeah, well, look, great. And, and, for, and for you, Darren, what, what do you feel is important about leaving a legacy in your lifetime? Well, I think it's interesting. Well, I suppose my starting point was very similar to Peter's, not, not the cricketing one, but kind of I grew up thinking uh, I should always do something that I love and I'm fortunate and privileged enough to do so. Uh, so the legacy that I kind of hope that I, I leave and is important to me is both imparting that passion for the things that I love for others, but also that I have a positive impact on others rather than just simply a positive impact on myself. So mm. I think it's really, really important. There's, you know, legacy, I think James said, is uh, I took from what he says, you know, your legacy is judged by others, not by yourself, uh, I think more powerfully. And, and therefore it's about how do you uh, leave things in a better place than you, you found it. And, you know, the, the area that I have the privilege of working in is all about that. So uh, either because of what you create or who you create it with. And I think those two things are really important. So what's the outcome and how did you get there? And if people look at that and say, that's a great place to, place to have left, or that's a great uh, passion to have left within somebody else, then I think that would be a great legacy and that's what I think is important for it. Mm. Yeah, beautifully put. Thank you for that, Darren. And Paul, uh, CEO of the National Nuclear Laboratories, um, what, what do you feel is uh, the important about leaving a legacy in your lifetime? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made by uh, folks, actually. And I think that there's a number of different ways of looking at it from the organisational context and also from the personal uh, context. Uh, for me, um, I'm a nuclear physicist and uh, a lot of nuclear physicists work in, in banking now um, because of handling the maths and the, the equations. There's, there's a lot of read over and, and uh, I dabbled a lot with that, but it doesn't give you that personal sense of fulfillment about why am I actually here, what I'm trying to, to achieve. Uh, and for me personally, and this is where you, I think you have a strong connection with what one's trying to do with an organization is uh, recognizing the need to address climate change. And uh, that is the greatest existential threat that we face. And the, the role in terms of getting there, we need absolutely everything available in terms of technology. The size of the challenge is just monumental. And I don't think people have yet realized just how great this challenge actually is. So from a personal point of view, to be able to get up in the morning and know that what we are doing is to effectively address climate change 
uh, it can give you a real sense of well-being. And that's exactly what we've done in the organisation. And people feel, yeah, that's why we're here. That's what we're doing. That's what gets us up in the morning. Similarly, uh, we, we use radionuclides for addressing cancer treatment. So to be able to say that people are developing technologies that will address uh, cancer, again, it's a great uh, it's a great sense of achievement. So to be able to give that to an organisation, a real true sense of purpose beyond a monetary value is extremely powerful and it's resonating with so many people. In terms of leaving a legacy as an individual, as a CEO, uh, that's where I start to get a little bit concerned because... Uh, I am fortunate enough to be custodian of the organization at present, but its durability and sustainability as a business needs to go way beyond my lifetime. And certainly for, for our industry, we, you know, we measure things over, over decades. Um, we have plans that go out hundreds of, hundreds of years, way beyond my lifetime. And the stuff that we are doing now, I will never, ever see in my lifetime through to, through to fruition. Uh, so it's an honour to be custodian of that organisation. I would be concerned if there's, I think to James's point, if there's too much focus by a CEO on their own personal legacy as opposed to what they're trying to do with the organisation and to make sure that organisation is, is sustainable in the future and, and I can help to set it up on that path to success way beyond you know, my lifetime of, uh, of looking after that business. So. Uh, I think from a personal point of view, the connection with legacy is a strong one of your purpose. But from an organisational point of view, I think that's where we just need to pull the dial back a bit. Mm. No, th thanks for that, Paul. And now, Lee, the CEO of the Inspiring Leadership Trust. Uh, Lee, what would, uh, from your point of view, what do you feel is important about leaving a legacy in your lifetime? Yeah, I agree with so many of the comments made so far and that, that context around the why, so finding your passion and channeling your effort towards something that's just so important to you, um, but to be to be informed along the way. So when you're you're looking at the issues, because there are a lot right that 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 are out there, and to look at the issues, the ones that resonate for you, that you can help to affect some change around. And I think that's really important. So it has resonance for you, and you can do something about. It, but not to feel overwhelmed by the challenges and the. Um, and therefore postpone any engagement around, well, what can I personally do? And I think, you know, off the back of the pandemic, um, and every, it's not off the back of the pandemic, we're still in the pandemic, but, you know, we're emerging from it in a, in a, in a kind of a new way. Um, but we saw how people galvanised around community and that spirit. And, and I wonder how much more we could do of that. And, and maintain it and sustain it. So rather than being parochial and myopic and caught up in our day-to-day -day lives, just knowing that a little bit like the butterfly effect, as we galvanize together, as we think about what we want to channel our efforts to, whether it's climate change, whether it's eradicating poverty, whether it's addressing um, health issues or whatever it is, as we galvanize around that, that we, we throw our energy at it and it just small amounts can make huge impact um, by working together. And then the other area for me is about, about being authentic and true. So in a kind of, you know, in this socially connected social media world that we're in and CSR is, you know, a, a big hot topic for any organization, authenticity around the agenda um, for it not to be channeled towards business results, but actually a true authentic um, view of what you want to be doing for the community um, leveraging your talents, leveraging your resources and people in the right way for the right reasons, um, with the right intention, and that sustainability piece being part of it is 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 so essential. Mm. No, thank you, Lee. And and before we go on to the next question, I've just got a couple of points I've got to add to what the conversation so far. The next question that James is going to lead on in a moment is, what's your view on organisations leaving legacy? You might talk about the Royal British Legion or the British Army or anything like that, James, but... We'll just talk about your view on organisations leaving legacy. My, my thoughts on this first question, though, um, I, I suppose I make it deeply personal in that on Friday last week, my, my brother David died. Um, now, he was only 63 and, and he died um, 10 weeks after being diagnosed with metastatic cancer. The reason I mention it is not for any sympathy, but, but to just say while we were having conversations, knowing that he knew he was going to die, he was interested in his legacy that was on his mind 
and, and, and he looked at others and he went, well, you know, Graham's done this. My, my, my brother Graham was a president of the British Plastic Surgeons and said, look, you've done these things that, you know, maybe I've not done enough in my lifetime. Uh, and, and I assured him that he had, that actually his legacy was not only his family, his, his daughter, his grandson. He managed to, three days before he died, he managed to go to the monkey, uh, monkey zoo farm and in a wheelchair uh, to take his grandson and his wife and his daughter. Um, and, and there's the happiest picture, which is that one. And I say that because a legacy can be your family. And I think people often think, oh, crikey, I'm never going to be an army general or I'm never going to get knighted or I'm never going to be the CEO of a publishing company or nuclear laboratories or anything of the, that you guys have done. But actually, don't forget that you can make a, a lasting legacy that you leave in the way you touch those in the smaller circle. Because as he was dying, he wanted a few friends to come and see him. He wanted his two brothers to speak to him and, and his own family. And he's a very private kind of guy. Uh, but, but we all value his life. And it was the dash between 1959 dash 2021. Uh, and and uh, what do you do in the dash between when you're born and when you die? And there's an amazing amount you can pack into it, but also it's how people remember you. So people forget what you see, they forget what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. And I think that doesn't need to be as you're, as in David's case, as he was dying in our last two conversations, but it's just daily. How do you leave people feeling? Because you don't know when your numbers go up. D David didn't, 10 weeks ago, he didn't plan to die. He was doing 10,000 steps a day and everything was going fine. And suddenly life changed. And so we don't know when the number's up. So I think the thing about legacy in your lifetime, you don't know when your number's up. My father was killed when he was 33. He lived his whole life. It was just 33 years. And whether it be Emma having to deal with people who've got ovarian cancer and just th their life ends or whatever it might be, or, or Peter dealing with people in the NSPCC. You, you know, don't know how long you've got, so make the most of what you've got and, and the impact that you leave just on people very close to you. That's a legacy. Doesn't have to be building a bridge or a, a castle or, or, or something quite famous. So that's just my thought, making it quite personal. James, over to you, please, on the next view, but your view on organizations leaving a legacy. Okay, Jonathan, well, before I do, I just want to say that I thought that was very well put. And I can see that it caused some emotion in you. And I think you've summarized all our conversations extremely well by bringing it back to your brother. And um, I'm articulating that through a personal example, I think is a wonderful way to bring out the point that it is about you as an individual and what you achieve. And that point I tried to make earlier on about being selfless about your legacy. So well put. Um, institutions, I think the difference here and organizations is that the legacy is about what the organization does for individuals. And it's sort of a reversal, really. And we all know from history, there are organizations which have been and gone, and some have left very positive impact on the world, and some have left a very negative impact on the world. Uh, and I think you probably think an organization that um, has got a good legacy is one that keeps going. And I would say, wouldn't I, that I think the British Army is, is a wonderful organization. It's been going for 350 years. And uh, I think, you know, by and large, it's, it's left a very good legacy on all sorts, in all sorts of areas. Well, in fact, not by and large, but, you know, almost 99%, it left a very good legacy in all sorts of areas. And I also, as you said, mentioned the Royal British Legion. It's been going for exactly 100 years. And its legacy is about what it does for others. And in particular, in the, in the objectives of the charity, it's about the beneficiaries, which are, of course, veterans and their families and actually also the serving community. So I think the difference is the legacy of an institution is about what it does for others. And its success clearly is how long it keeps going and how successful it's been is, is often determined by, by the length of its, of its service and, and its, its work. Um, and the, you know, the, the failings are about its failings to, 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 to do good and to achieve good um, on, on the people that, that it, it looks after or focuses on. Brilliant. Thank you, James. And, and thank you for that earlier comment. Much appreciated. Emma, for you, uh, what's your view on organizations leaving a legacy? Because you, you're involved in many different organizations as well as being CEO of SEC Newgate. But uh, what's, what's your thoughts on this? 
Uh, yeah, so th this it's different between the two because charities, of course, exist to, to do work that makes them not needed at a point in the future. So um, with the Elton John AIDS Foundation, as an example, the UN goal and, and for the UK is to, to make their, um, to put an end to HIV by 2030 um, and to have no new transmissions in the UK by that date. There is nothing else in my life that I'm involved with where something is so close to being achievable. When I look at something like ovarian cancer, you know, we're talking about what will happen by 2050 and so on, and, and that's just you know, double, doubling the survival rate. So, um, so that's a really interesting thing in terms of charities and their legacy um, you know, being to make big strides in the area they're focused on. Whereas the, in the commercial world, um, so Sec Newgate, which I am chief executive of, um, there, the interesting um, thing that we've been going through is um, to achieve B Corp status, B Corporation status. Uh, and that's been a really, uh, we've submitted our application now, but the process that I've been going through has, has really made me think a lot about the need for the business to be for the good of everybody, not just the shareholders. Um, and so that, that um, you know, that's that's a that's a different kind of legacy, and, and picking up on on Paul's point about uh, climate change and so on, uh, I think as a, as a the, as a corporate that probably having kickstarted that process and and the legacy that are the, the tiny part of that that we can play, but a very important bit, I think will be good not just for this generation but generations to come, um, and the whole way that we do business the benefit of uh, of all our stakeholders rather than just our shareholders uh, and ju as i say the process of doing that has has made me think differently not about a, a lot of the things we were doing but some things i've really had to think hard about how as a corporate you know we can change the way that we operate and think um, mm. make our contribution thanks emma uh, very very good points well made and thank you uh, on to Peter Wallace at the NSPCC. Peter, what's your view on organisations leaving a legacy? Well, the NSPCC was founded in 1884, and uh, I don't think the founder and my predecessor, ultimate predecessor, um, Reverend Benjamin War, would have imagined that we'd still be fighting today to prevent cruelty to children. So I very much associate with Emma's observations about um, charities looking to work themselves out of existence, but 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 maybe Reverend Benjamin War, for all his many qualities, didn't foresee um, the internet and online challenges and how the how the world has changed. Um, but as well as bequeathing to us this extraordinary iconic um, organisation that is there as a kind of conscience for child protection and child safety for the nation, he also. Um, set a really kind of demanding pace for um, the, the organisation. So founded in 1884, by 1889, the UK had passed its first Children's Act. And for the first time, children became the responsibility of adults other than the people in their immediate family. So he is an inspiration to me and to others in the charity when people talk rather kind of loosely about five year plans and 10 year plans and, and all the rest of it. There's a lot of work to be done and we need constantly to be reinventing ourselves to be as relevant as we possibly can be to the challenges at any particular moment in time. So, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, a, num a number of people um, may even remember the, the cruelty man. And it almost always was a man who wore a uniform and was in a community uh, employed by the NSPCC to be there if you had a worry or concern about a child. Well, we've moved on a long way from that, but that was the most important thing for the charity to be doing at, at that period. Today, there are extraordinarily important things we need to be doing to design child protection into the online world so that the legacy for children that come uh, in, in the future is a place to live their lives that has the fundamental protections that we have come to expect um, in, the, in the offline world. So I think you know, organizational legacy is about having really strong sense of purpose, having pace and having relevance. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Peter. Really profound. And, and Darren, um, 
For you, what's your view on organisations leaving a legacy? Uh, I suppose coming in from the perspective of the kind of woods and trees business, which is a, a long term business, like as, as Paul says, you know, we we look after and inherited the legacy of others uh, who have protected and restored trees that are standing for a thousand years. So um, it's I think organisationally, um, I think it is a vehicle for individuals. I think it's a vehicle for individuals to to deliver their own personal legacy, but in a collective way. You know, we are we are the as be, you know, it's been said we are the first generation to understand the impacts of climate change and the last generation to be able to do something about it. Uh, and I would put on top of that uh, nature loss. These two things are both existential threats to uh, hum humanity and being able to organizationally do something about it and have people uh, both for people and with people. I think that's where an organizational legacy comes in. It's not only giving a vehicle to people who are in the, in the charity, but it's also a vehicle for people who want to play their part. And I think charities uh, across, the, across the piece are enabling organizations when they're really leaving a legacy that goes beyond simply doing things for people it's about doing it with people. Uh, mm. And that, that legacy then really lasts, you know, beyond a lifetime. And the organization, you know, is uh, that I'm privileged to be CEO of from the Woodland Trust perspective is going to be here for many years to come because the challenges are going to be the here, but also the opportunities and the benefits. And I think mm. it's making sure that there is, uh, those benefits are felt by everybody and not just simply the few. Um, and that would be, again, that would be an organisational uh, legacy that goes beyond simply the individual. Yeah, beautifully put. Thank you, Darren. And I, I, I did like that point with the, the first generation to understand the extent of the problem and the, and, and the last one that probably can do something really about it. Um, great. And going on, nicely goes on to Paul uh, at uh, NNL. Paul, what's your view on uh, organisations leaving a legacy and sustainability as well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so some really interesting uh, points uh, made uh, so far. And uh, I was thinking actually in terms of uh, Darren's organization and the longevity of your products. Uh, I, I think I think you probably do outdo the longevity of, of what we do as well. So, uh, yeah, two, two really long term industries. Uh, they're really quite interesting. I haven't thought about it in that sense. Uh, and uh, also uh, to Emma's uh, point with regards to the existence of, of charities, uh, I'd never thought about charities in that in that sense that you know were working effectively to do themselves, you know, out of existence. F fascinating point that. Um, I also like the the point that Emma raised with regards to the recognition between um, uh, stakeholders and shareholders and the general move towards. Uh, a business looking in a much more holistic sense with regards to its stakeholders as opposed to its ju just its shareholders. Uh, and, and I think generally in society, there really seems to be a trend uh, towards that uh, now. Certainly for us, if, if I just look down, say, the financial lens, then, um, you know, it's interesting, um, but it's not going to set the world on fire. It's not, you know, it's not amazing. Um, but um, uh, in terms of revenue turnover, yeah, fine. But what we do is we measure ourselves by the value that we bring to our customers. And we're actually working quite closely with them and really pushing the customers. So that we really want to get to the point here as to how can we jointly measure what is this value? So when we say the connection to purpose as well that was raised um, by Peter, massively important. If you can really get that sense of, of purpose and the longevity associated with it, um, then um, you know I think that's just so important, and that purpose being aligned to then what you measure as success in your business, I think is really important. And that to me, if, if businesses can get there, then I think that you you, you can crack this um, issue over what are we measuring in the business, what do we target the business on, what are we communicating to our shareholders and our stakeholders, and how do we personally measure our uh, our own success. It's quite interesting. Um, uh, you can probably see behind me, so like the, the Harvard ban. I went to Harvard just before um, the uh, the pandemic hit and they got us all together um, halfway through the pandemic to say, look, how's it going for you know your businesses and things like that? 
And one of the things that they said, this is a really rough time for all businesses. But if you have a strong sense of purpose as a business, and if that purpose is still true, your business will get through this, uh, will get through this pandemic. And, you know, it's the jobs of boards and, and executive teams to just stay true to the purpose of the, the organisation. So the pandemic, I guess, has been a test of everything squashed into a really short space of time around understanding why businesses are here and what the value is to, to society. And uh, that's certainly how we look at it. I was challenged through uh, by my board through the pandemic. So, well, are you going to cut recruitment? Uh, because the numbers said, no, uh, no, absolutely not. I said, I, my purpose remains true. Uh, the longevity of the business means I've got to continue to recruit. I can't switch off that recruitment pipeline just because of this issue now, because of everything I'm doing, what I'm doing for my stakeholders still remains true. So it's actually we've actually been through, I think, a really interesting test on, on an organization's true purpose and its sustainability. Beautifully put. Uh, it resonates on many, many levels. Thank you for that. This conversation I'm really enjoying. Lee, um, what, what comes up for you, your view on organisations leaving a legacy? Um, so, well, I think there's kind of different models and I think we've evolved um, with our models. So first of all, we had a very philanthropic approach to how we, you know, so funding for charities and, um, and how we would engage with kind of social causes. Um, and it's really starting to evolve into something different. So um, more of a transformative kind of business model where we really look at um, what we do as a business, what's at our core, what's our purpose as a business, but then how could we leverage all of our talents, our resources, our networks, everything that we have to not just think about funding for charities, that very transactional kind of approach to, to engaging with different causes, but how do we affect change? So how do we take assets, resources, a whole kind of range of things and look at the purpose, the, the agenda that we're trying to achieve. So for us, it's about how do we help to um, create greater um, economic inclusion for women and girls so that they can feel empowered and financially independent to move into a different space in their lives. So that's our agenda. But, but that connection between a business's purpose and, and a charitable cause is, is really powerful. And you can see how that by working together, we, we can make those fundamental shifts. So I think that for me personally, I, that moving from philanthropic to what can I really do here to really affect change and move away from transactional was really important. And that also operational effectiveness so as organizations look at how do we source, how do we employ, how do we um, look at our supply change, ch chains? So not just seeing CSR as a, a separate agenda but there's organizations like Unilever and Asda that have been doing some really fantastic work about how they look at the end-to-end -end and their strategic intention for um, the business right through in terms of how they affect change in, in communities because that's where that's at the cold face right where people are affected and we want to affect we want to create change so so they've been you know creating jobs they've um, they, there's a huge uh, amount of work that's been done around sustainability there and I think looking to those organizations as the benchmark, the role models to, to say, well, what does excellence look like? And what does that mean for us? And what can we do? What are the steps that we can start to take, even if we're not nowhere near there? How can we move towards it? And then the work that we've been doing, like the, the issues in communities are complicated. And I think the experience is there's a highly competitive market with limited funding, li limited resources and limited voices and lots of fads going on that are very short term. And then we move on to the next fad and really linking back like Emma's connection to the UN goals and what is it we're trying to really achieve and what are the big issues um, that, that we're trying to affect, looking back to what it, the, the bigger picture. Um, and then that at a local level, how do we collaborate more? Because the issues are complicated when we're working with the Home Office around serious and organised crime and local social services around mental health and wellbeing issues, a whole kind of range and poverty. Actually, all you can have one person presenting multiple conditions or issues, etc. So um, how do you effectively collaborate across different organisations, looking at the systems, the processes, the way that we engage, so not competing anymore, but moving towards a more 
um, collaborative connected model um, in the future, I think will be, that's how we're going to affect change back to the butterfly effect. Brilliant. Thank you, Lee. Um, some really good points. And, and, and you've touched on and, and also Paul and others have touched on this thing about purpose, what, what in the inspiring leadership compass that you designed uh, and what makes high performing leaders and teams that we measure that, 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 PQ, which is about what people's meaning and purpose, what gives people meaning and purpose, what gives organizations mission, vision, meaning and purpose, is very closely linked to their MQ, which is their integrity, their morals, their values, and then linked to this third area we're talking about, which is LQ. And those are three of the eight components of what makes high performing organizations and teams. And I think the link between purpose, legacy, and, and values, it's so, so closely linked. Uh, so great, we've got about uh, a minute a person, um, a couple of minutes a person, let's say. Um, let's combine the last two questions I have. Um, what does stewardship mean to you and leave things better than you found them? And what would be your legacy top tip? Perhaps we can combine those in, in one go. And James, would you start us off? You know, what does stewardship mean to so you? I leaving... this phone. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> while James is doing that, Emma, would you, would you start us off with, um, what does stewardship mean for you and leaving things better than you found them? And what would be your legacy top tip to anybody listening? Uh, I, I, I'm going to just pick up on uh, Lee's point there, if I may, about um, uh, this, this whole thing about working together rather than in silos and the phenomenal things that could be achieved. So if you look at what's happened with the vaccine, um, you know, when we have not managed to cure the common cold and things, but the whole all these scientists getting together and we didn't just have one vaccine you know we've got a, a number that's a remarkable thing so when I look at um, the fact that HIV is the largest killer of young people or second largest killer of young people in the world between the ages of 12 and 24 still how can we possibly end it by 2030 the answer is because we've got the drugs because we've got the test and we've got all the know-how now if we can all work together it is possible to 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 do that um, and so I think this is a key to um, the way forward in terms of a great legacy is, is of people really working together um, rather than silos. And I think the, um, the, the thing about, um, if you look at charities, uh, that, that old saying of, you know, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, uh, teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And I think there's so much in that in terms of what we can do. So things such as social impact bonds for charities are far more sustainable than just simply giving people a handout uh, mm. and, 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 and those models. And, and I, my, my um, sort of thought on uh, my top tip, if you like, is that we all have a duty to replace ourselves in the role that we're in, whether it's in a in a in, a, in an organisation or in a charity, um, with somebody who is even better and who can take it onto the next level. And and that's so important, rather than just saying, "Haven't I done a great job?" But I think mm. I, I I always see it as my most important job to to find that person who's much better who can take it onto the next level. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. Only Donald Trump thought the same. Okay, thank you, Emma. That's great. James, how about you? Um, what does stewardship mean for you and leaving things better than you found them? And what would be your legacy top tip in a couple of minutes? Thank you. No, I, I think I'd, I'd just spin that slightly to, to what Emma's just said very eloquently. I think the you know, stewardship should mean everything to you in terms of your responsibilities that you hold at the time. And I think it's so important that you go into anything you do with a view to say, I will leave it in a better way than I found it. Not because of what you want out of it, but for what you want to do to the institution or whatever it is you're, you are working with, you want to leave it in a better place. And actually your legacy is that the person who comes behind you is able to take on and run and deal with whatever environment you've been working on better than when, when you started. And I, I do see where things, and I'll just give a negative spin on this, where people have burnt out institutions for their own good they go on to greater things but they leave behind them a trail of destruction mm -hmm. and and difficult personnel issues perhaps bankruptcy do you know and and yet somehow they they, they emerge from this with, with their own reputation better but actually they've burnt out so i think you need to reverse that you need to say i'm going to leave the institution stronger and and i think that would be my top tip that, that you that you want to do better the institution you're working with 
and leave it in a stronger place from when you when you leave. And I think very few people achieve legendary status, if you want to put it that way, in their lifetime or have a you know really have a, a legacy in their lifetime. Very few people. Um, most of us are we, will do the best we can and be remembered for, for hopefully making the things we work with better. Beautifully put. And, and you reminded me of my old Sergeant Major who uh, was so impressed by me that he said, sir, you're a, you're a legend in your own lunchtime. Um, but I think that was a, I think that was a disparaging co comment about me yeah. along the lines of the cricket. But thank you for that, James. That's a great and Emma too. Peter, um, wh what would you combine as stewardship, what it means for you uh, and your legacy top tip? So in terms of um, stewardship, um, I see myself uh, with this extraordinary kind of responsibility and privilege to hold this thing, which is precious thing, which is the NSPCC. And I am the pivot between children over here who are experiencing abuse and neglect or at risk of abuse and neglect and many thousands of individuals and organizations over here who share a passion to want to contribute to doing something about that. So it's um, with me, with us, not about us, and acting as that pivot to connect the two with one another as seamlessly as possible so that the children get what they deserve and the donors and supporters derive great pleasure from whether they're giving money, time, insight, whatever that might be. Mm. Um, in terms of um, my, uh, my, my, my top tip, um, in every single encounter, in every single action which we take, um, we can bring energy, we can bring purpose, we can bring kindness. So legacy is not just about what we do, it's about how we do it. Um, and uh, my top tip is, you know, life's not a rehearsal, don't um, play at it, um, be the best you can be. And you can be uh, nasty and driven and destructive, uh, or you can be kind and compassionate and authentic. You know, it costs nothing to be kind. So I started with the cricket and I'll end with the music. And Frank Turner had a recent um, album, which was called Be More Kind. And so that's my um, legacy top tip. Let's all just be more kind. Thanks, Peter. Very nicely put. Darren, how about you? Um, if you were to combine what does stewardship mean for you and leaving things better than you found them? And what's your legacy top tip to the listeners? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I suppose my, the, those who I work with probably get sick of me saying uh, something along the lines of, do you think the person who's going to do your job next, will they be grateful for the decisions that you're making? Um, because when we, you know, we are, we are acquiring land, we are, you know, we are uh, working with a whole range of different communities, uh, but with the choices that we make today will have a legacy which will either make it an asset for the cause or a liability for the cause in the future. And I think what part of that stewardship role is to ensure that we're making decisions which act with urgency for the urgency of the cause that we are facing but also uh, to think about what those next generation of conservationists are going to, uh, going to inherit as a result of our, of our choices. I think that's the, so getting that right is really important. And I, you know, a bit like James, the one caveat I'd put in it is we have to make sure that doesn't make us too cautious. It doesn't make us think too much about actually um, if we do this, it's a bit of a risk because I, frankly, the, when the, when, things, when something's on fire, you need to deal with it. You can't simply say, well, we hope it's going to be better in the future. So we have to be bold. Uh, so stewardship means being bold, but also being clear about what that uh, future will look like. And that, and that burning platform is no longer burning and is on a stronger, and is on a stronger first thing. Um, and I would say my top tip would be always bear in mind the, the future when you're making your decisions, but don't let it hamper taking the decision. Yeah, that's very, very nice to put. Thanks, Darren, for that. Um, and Paul, what would be um, your definition of, of what stewardship means for you and leaving things better than you found them? And what's your leadership top tip? 
So uh, re really good points made, and uh, a lot of them uh, uh, resonate with uh, uh, with myself that uh, others have, have mentioned. Uh, the top tip, I think, just starting there is, uh, Jonathan, it's what you touched on. I think it's the alignment between one's own value system and the purpose of an organisation. And I think when you get a strong alignment there, then um, uh, the, the, the organisation will benefit. When there's a misalignment, I think that's when we see businesses go wrong. Uh, if, your, if your value system differs from what the organisation is trying to achieve, you'll get caught out. And unfortunately, it won't be good for the organisation. Uh, with regards to uh, stewardship uh, as well, um, and uh, to pick up on what Peter's saying, yeah, it's the, it's the privilege and the honour of being custodian of uh, an organisation for a brief period in its history. And as James was saying, the duty is to make it better than, you know, what it was when, when you know, we, we, we took these organisations over, but to put them on a, a, a sustainable path for the future. Uh, for, for me, the, uh, the duty associated with looking after the UK's nuclear capability uh, to underpin everything that we do in the country uh, is one which I have certainly felt in the past few years in the role of one thinking that uh, I, need to, I need to make sure that the country has this capability for the future. So for me, just one aspect I'll just pick on. Uh, is around bringing in um, early stage career um, people into the organisation. And if I could say one thing to my successor uh, in, this, in this business, whenever that time comes, is to say, you have got to look after these people. You have got to give them exciting and rewarding careers for the future. And uh, I, I would not be happy handing the business over to somebody who uh, I, was, I would not be able to have that conversation with and get their reassurance that that is something that they will focus on because that capability is just, is just so important that we maintain and to give young people exciting and rewarding uh, careers uh, is, is just is, is so important. Thank you very much, Steve Paul. And Lee, would you uh, end us off before I round up with your two minutes on uh, what stewardship means for you and leave things better than you found them. Uh, and what um, is your legacy top tip? Uh, so, uh, you know, stewardship, uh, it's an interesting one. It's all about you individually. It's all about you and nothing to do with you whatsoever at all. It's like this paradox between, you know, being completely responsible for helping to affect change, but actually... Um, it's also it's not about you it's not that it, it's a selfless act and I think it needs to remain that way because otherwise you get caught up in the positive strokes or because you're doing something that's very values based and driven you it, it can suck you into um, into almost becoming toxic in your view of the world toxic for yourself or toxic in the way that you interact and you stop listening to others as well so I think there's something about stewardship which is not to detach it from the ego and to self-check against the ego as well. And with that, um, and you're the sum of your, the, the, the parts, right? So um, uh, the, the team around you are really, really important when it comes to stewardship. So um, it's, it's making sure that, that that purpose and that alignment is there. Um, and just being careful of the emotional wake. And I'm new into all of this. I'm just a few years into setting up and leading a charitable organization. And with the emotional empathy comes tiredness and, you know, that compassion and the weight of responsibility. And so I suppose my top tip will be about thinking about how you manage your time and the way that you think about the organisation, the people, and also yourself. So putting your own oxygen mask on first because of the emotions that it taps into along the way. Beautifully put. Thank you, Lee. And, and so my thanks just in, in wrapping up, and we've perfectly timed it, team, as always. You uh, all contributed beautifully. My thanks to uh, Lieutenant General James Bashel, President of the Royal British Legion, and also former Army Commander, and uh, now advising to boards and top teams who are fortunate to have him. Uh, Emma Kane, the, the CEO of SEC Newgate, but also in her role as Chair of Target of Aryan Cancer and on the board of the Elton John AIDS Foundation. So Peter Wanless, the CEO of the NSPCC, and also on the board of uh, Somerset uh, CCC, County Creek Club, 
and Darren Moorcroft, the CEO of the Woodland Trust, and Paul Howarth, the CEO of the National Nuclear Laboratories, and Lee Bowman Perks, the CEO of the Inspiring Leadership Trust. Thank you to you all. A really great conversation. And in a couple months' time, in September, we'll have another great session. And I look forward to some of the CEOs being on there then. But thank you to you all. A really great contribution. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.